Okay, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm going to talk... Thanks for... I guess I should thank Tom and I for inviting me. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about gene environment interplay insights from animal models. Here we go again. Oh, my computer. Oh, boy. Okay, no sweat. It's under control. <laughs> Funding for my research. And, okay, so just to reiterate, genes and behavior are what we're going to talk about, gene environment interplay, and the nature nurture fallacy, which I talked about, Francis and others. Genes do not determine, control, or cause behavior. Rather, they influence the probability that behavioral differences will be expressed in a given environment. And they do this by interacting with the environment. I promise this is the only slide that has this many words on it. But I did want to say that behavior genetics, themes from model organisms, do have applicability to humans. And if one looks at the animal work and the human work, we can conclude that there's significant genetic variation for most behavioral traits. You take any animal, you do artificial selection, and you get a response for most things. Multiple genes affect each behavioral trait. It used to be thought that these genes all had small, equal, and additive effects on the behavior. We now know that most have small effects, but there are some more major effect genes, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the foraging gene. Pleiotropy rules. What this means is that when you find a gene that affects behavior, it will almost always have multiple phenotypes. So one gene affecting many things. It could be different behaviors. It could be some developmental trait. And often those traits are not related in a causal way. They're gene by environment interactions. They're pervasive and persuasive. Um, the environment affects gene expression. We've heard about that. We know there's genes that affect social behavior. Sex differences are also very common in gene expression. And genetic background is very important. This is something that has not come up yet in that conference, in this conference. So if you're studying one gene and the effect it has on a phenotype, you ha that gene is in a context of many, many other genes. So if we were looking at fruit flies collected from Toronto and fruit flies collected from Arizona, it could be that the fruit flies from Toronto learn at this level and the Arizonian fruit flies, I'm making this up, um, learn at this level. But if we took a homozygous dunce mutation, a gene that makes flies stupid, I'm being anthropomorphic, it would, could bring down the Toronto flies this much and the Arizona flies this much, let's say. So it's the same homozygous mutant alleles put in a different genetic background. Flies caught from Arizona, flies caught from Toronto, and the level of the performance is different. They're still both having a significant effect, but the level is different. That's what we mean by genetic background. And single gene genes affect downstream genes. So if you're reading in the newspaper, there's a gene for this, there's a gene for that, it's likely that it's also not correct. But if there is the case that there is a gene that affects a phenotype, and there's two alleles of that gene that's being studied. Genetically, it could be mapped to that one place, to that one gene. But by virtue of having those different types, there are hundreds of downstream genes that are affected by those differences in alleles in those two types. When we say there's a major gene effect on a phenotype, all that means is genetically, we could map it to the DNA there but there will be many other genes whose expression has changed as a result of the individual having those two alleles. So I just wanted to make that point. So now I need to convince you, and I don't think it'll be hard, that flies are really cool. I mean, you've heard Joel's talk. You will hear Ed's talk. But also that they have a social life. And when I started this work in the 1970s, I never dreamed how complex their social life was and also how fun. And so you can um, take a naive female who's here watching this female choose between this male or that male for a mate. And after she has some experience of watching, if you pair her with one male or the other, she'll choose the mate that her experienced sister chose. You can show that males fight, and you're going to hear all about that today. And then they will behave differently depending on whether they were the winner or the loser of that fight. There's courtship conditioning, where a naive male is trying to court a mated female, and she keeps kicking him in the head, kicking him in the head over time, and eventually his courtship is suppressed. He's learned, <laughs> I better avoid her, you know? 
And one of my former students, Carla Kahn, has shown that it also can drive a, fem a male to drink. So he will go and start binge, I'm not joking, binging on alcohol to whatever, sedate himself. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So there's also so social oviposition learning, and IE fly can watch where other flies choose to lay their eggs, and she will copy. She will take the blue substrate that my colleague Fred Mary gives them, or the yellow. So it's it's very interesting. There's even cultural transmission of that learning. So, anyways, I'm going to talk to you about the foraging gene, which has been the focus of the research in my lab for many, many years. And you need to know that all organisms have it, including us. It affects energy balance, fruit intake, food-related movement, learning, and memory. And different individuals, when you're a fruit fly, can have different forms of the gene. Some are rovers and some are sitters. And interestingly, how much protein this gene makes depends on the environment. I'm going to show you some data about that. So if you put fruit fly larvae, these are the maggots, in a yeast-covered petri dish, you'll find that some move a lot while they eat and some move less. And these are animals you can take out of fruit from an orchard and you'll find these two types. There are two distributions, they overlap, but you don't have this one continuous normal distribution. There's two approaches to life as a fruit fly maggot. And it isn't that these guys are slow or couch potatoes because if you put them in the absence of food, they both move equally well. The larval flies and the larvae and the adults, the rovers tend to move from patch to patch and the sitters, as larvae, go to the nearest food patch and stay there. And a colleague of mine, Tori Higgins from Columbia, who's a social psychologist, thinks that the rovers are like humans that are locomotors. They're always on the move. I don't know what I'm doing, shaking my hands, but anyways. <laughs> and their mind is always on the move. And the sitters are like assessors. They sit back, they check out the situation, they evaluate it, and then they move. And he advises business that you should have different proportions of locomotors and assessors in a group, and who the leader should be. You don't want an assessor when the whole group working there is a locomotor, for instance. They're going to drive each other crazy. So in flies, we find 70% rovers and 30% sitters persisting over time. And from an evolutionary perspective, it's interesting to try and figure out why we have those both types. And I'd be happy to talk about that in the question period. So just to give you a quick look at how we do this really high-tech behavior, we spread yeast on a dish. We put a, a larva in the center of each. We give them five minutes. It's sped up for your entertainment. Um, and then my uh, students put... So yeah, there's a visible trail left on the yeast, and my student Craig, in this case a former PhD, digitize, takes the line and digitizes it. And that's it. We also look at other behavior, but this quick assay allowed us to screen 5,000 animals in a week and generate mutants of the gene so that we're able to localize it and understand it. Okay, the adult fly also does some interesting things. The rovers differ from the sitters when they're food deprived and put on a drop of food. The sitters, when, it fin when they finish eating, will make tight little circles around the drop and the rover walks out in straight line movement. And there are other interesting adult behaviors. So you can ask a fly, how hungry are you? This is an assay that Brian Hewson does in my lab. He's here. And if you ask the fly how hungry it is, it will stick out its... its proboscis to say I want to eat. So what Brian's doing here is he's putting a tiny little drop on the leg and the leg has taste receptors and then the fly says feed me. You know, just like that movie, feed me. So maybe you don't know the movie. But anyway, so it's possible to give the fly, the fly some kind of food deprivation. I'm being too silly, but anyways. Okay, so anyways, when we, when we look at all these behavioral phenotypes, we find out that they map to a single major gene. And this was done over many years using quantitative genetic analysis and other kinds of analyses that you can use in Drosophila. And when Kate Osborne was a post PhD student in the lab, she cloned the gene and showed that it was a CGMP-dependent protein kinase, a signaling molecule, which I'm going to call PKG. And it's an enzyme found in certain neurons in the brain, it's found in the gut, and then the fat body. Um, and if, what we need to know today is that rover heads and larval CNSs have more of this enzyme than sitters do. And the gene at, at, is very complex. The more we study it, the more complex we know it is. This is the genomic DNA. This, and Aaron Allen in my lab is doing some very interesting molecular work to try and dissect the function of, of these 
11 transcripts, four protein isoforms. He's shown there's four promoters. And he works with um, Stephen Goodwin at Oxford. He's now deleted the gene using homologous recombination. And he's able to put the rover back inside, the sitter back inside, and make different kinds of mutants to analyze which parts of these genes are important for the expression of the gene. So the gene is regulated over time temporally and also over space. To know that we cloned the gene, we took this, that sequence and we transformed it into a fruit fly embryo. And this is a result we got. It's very statistical, but there are statistics. We had two sitter parents sitting around. Now normally, the rover is dominant to the sitter, but here the father's very perturbed because the baby is acting like a rover. He thinks he has a paternity issue. So you can do, in a sense, gene therapy. You can take the sitter embryo, you can transform the rover type PKG gene into it, and you get a rover. And that's the proof that you have the right DNA sequence. OK, so that's just to give you some quick background of more than 20 years of research. There's a little more than that. But now we want to ask, does the foraging gene listen and respond to the environment? And so from being part of the CIFAR group, EBBD, like many of us, our interests have shifted. And I've thought about things that I would have never thought of before. And so listening to my colleagues talk about low socioeconomic status, I realized that we can put Drosophila in a low SES background by giving them chronic low food deprivation through their larval life. And Carla Kahn, a former PhD student, did this. And so we, we know that when animals are fed well, and this is how we normally feed the flies, that rovers move more than sitters do. We also know that rovers eat less than sitters do. And we know under that, those well-fed conditions, as I said, that rovers have a higher level of the enzyme PKG in their brain than the sitters do. But Carla grew the larvae under chronic food deprivation. She reduced the level of sugar and the regular level of yeast, and then gave them lots of food when they were uh, older and asked what happens. And so both of them up their food intake high, and the level of gene expression is decreased. So in other words, a ro the expression of gene expression in the rover becomes like a sitter. So this gene is listening to the environment. And you can transform this back by putting the gene back in. So that was the first indication that the foraging gene is responsive to the environment and that chronic food deprivation will affect these behaviors. Now, James Burns, who's a postdoc, a CIFAR junior fellow, came to the lab, I guess, almost two years ago. And he wanted to ask this question of adult flies. And so he nutritionally deprived flies early in life. So he deprived the larvae. And then he asked, well, what happens to the adult in terms of its exploratory behavior? And he's shown, there's a poster here that showed it. But I'll give you a little bit of his results, that individual differences in sensitivity, sensitivity to early nutrition. So you chronically food deprive them as larvae. And then you see subsequent changes in their adult behavior. And James um, used an open field apparatus, which you might be familiar with in mice, but of course this one's very small. There's nothing in it, and you introduce a fly. And he noticed that some flies are high darting explorers. They move around towards the center of the dish, and they change their velocity darting, stopping and starting, going motion. And then others are low darting exploration. This is more like a rover, and this is more like a sitter. And they just hug the edges and go around in circles. And this is important from the life history of the fly for lots of reasons. Um, there's predators um, that, in fact, will grab a fly when it's out in the open. And whether you can, are able to stop or keep moving will depend on the extent of predation. I just wanted to show you that picture because it's pretty. But Ian Dworkin's lab does um, work on spiders and praying mantis. And he's relating the behavior of the flies walking around to the search strategies of these insects. OK, so James's results were very interesting. Firstly, at 100%, we can see that the rover is a darting explorer compared to the sitter. And then when you chronically food deprive them, again, they both become the same, like we saw for the larvae. And they both do a lot of darting and exploring. And so we see a change, but the significant change is in sitters. The sitter adults are more sensitive to the modification in the larval nutritional environment. So there's more plasticity in the sitters. And we can ask, 
well, what's responsible for this darting exploration? And in flies, you're able to target expression of genes to certain tissue. You can target it to certain neurons. You'll see beautiful examples of that um, today on, in the aggression talk. But here, we're, we're targeting it to the mushroom bodies, which Jean mentioned. And in flies, this is a place that integrates sensory information, and it's known to be important in learning and memory. And also, um, there was some evidence that it's important for this open field behavior. This is the expression of the foraging gene in these beautiful mushroom body structures. So what James did is he targeted foraging to the mushroom bodies using different independent lines that all had mushroom body expression. And, what, and we did this feeding them well. And what he found was that he could transform the low darting exploration behavior of a sitter and make it like a rover. And this proves that it's the foraging gene that's involved. It's enough to increase the level of expression of foraging in the mushroom bodies alone to change darting exploration from sitter-like to rover-like. Okay, and then for, I noticed that people in this group are getting more and more interested in evolution, which was w what my original training was in, so that's fun. But one can ask, well, what happens when you grow flies under chronic food deprivation when they're larvae? Is there some cost? And so we've looked at life history um, measures with Locke Rowe and Nicholas Svetik. Here's just an example of one of them. So these flies are grown under low uh, food chronic food deprivation and these high. And again, we see the response that sitters are more plastic. And we're measuring how many eggs are laid in, um, uh, in a, a big portion of their life. And so the rovers are not responding in terms of the fecundity of that female. We look at how many legs, eggs are laid every single day. And then the sitters have um, very nice egg laying patterns and a number of eggs, but when they grow under low food deprivation, they're affected. And so this says that this condition is affecting their health or their fitness as we measure it in, a, in an animal model. Okay, so this is um, new and it's just an idea, to give you an idea of what we're thinking now. So we can ask, how does a foraging gene listen to the environment? And we have a hypothesis, and I've been picking the brain of, of Mike Kabor and Mike Meany and other epigeneticists around here. So we have a hypothesis that epigenetic modification of foraging by a gene called EHMT, a euchromatin histone methyl transferase, a and I haven't asked Francis about this yet, wherever you are, Francis. Uh, a family of evolutionary conserved proteins that will write part of the epigenetic code through methylation of a histone 3 at lysine 9. That's the first time I've ever said that in a public talk. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Anyways, EHMT is a key epigenetic regulator of neuronal genes and processes. And Jamie Kramer, who was a postdoc with Annette Schenk in Nijmegen in the ne Netherlands, um, presented a paper on this, and we've been collaborating with them. So what, here's what we know so far. And one is that the foraging, the EHMT um, regulates a lot of different genes, but one of them that's regulated that is foraging. And when we look at wild type or normal EHMT animals compared to mutant animals who are missing the gene, we see a difference in the expression pattern of foraging. So the normal situation is when you're well fed, you have this level of foraging, but when you're food deprived, you, foraging gets downregulated. And when you don't have EHMT there at all, there's no effect. And you can see that statistically in, in Jamie's uh, unpublished data. Now then we look to see, well, what's EHMT doing in terms of the transcriptional control of foraging? And we can see that there are two peaks it, that correspond to two of the promoter regions that um, Aaron has found. And when you have an EHMT mutant, you're missing it, you lose these peaks. So that suggests that EHMT um, may be interacting with foraging. And then finally, in terms of the behavior of EHMT mutants, and this is just um, a parallel, you find that it, the larval behavior is affected. There's a normal, and that's EHMT mutants. They have more side paths. And in terms of learning and memory, um, in courtship conditioning, that assay where the mated female kicks the male in the head and says, slow down, and he adjusts his behavior, you find that the EHMT mutants have poorer short-term memory 
and long-term memory. We find the same with the foraging story. And so what we're doing now is we've made EHMT wild, normal and mutant animals in combination with rovers and sitters and sitter mutants to try and understand whether the epigenetic phenomenon is interacting with the allelic variation in foraging. And that those experiments are underway. So um, I hope that that will help us understand this interaction. It's tricky business because these, these regulators, these epigenetic regulators, are affecting lots of genes. And when you're interested in the effect on one and how it affects the behavior, um, it's challenging. But I, I hear there's new tools coming out for that. So let me just talk about learning and memory. Um, I mentioned to you that foraging acts in the mushroom bodies to affect learning and memory. And um, that we know that the gene is responsive to the environment. And you, you might want to know another way to measure learning and memory in fruit flies. And this is called an olfactory avoidance assay. It's an associative learning and memory assay. And what's done, and James does this in the lab, is you bring flies down an elevator, a little tiny elevator, and you put odors, let's say peach and banana, on each side. And when the flies go to one side, let's say peach, you shock them or you shake them. So that's the adversive uh, training. And you do it over and over again until they learn to avoid peach. And then you do the opposite experiment and teach them to avoid banana. And then 15 minutes later, you ask, well, how, how, do, how well do you recall what you've learned? And there you're just given peach and banana, no shock, and you measure how much they remember. And you can also do it at 24 hours, although I'm not showing that data today. And that's long-term memory. And there's a long literature in Drosophila that's shown that it's protein sensitive. Uh, protein sensitive. So in other words, we know a lot about learning in flies and this is just another assay that, that we use here. So the question now, this is with Fred Mary, who's a collaborator um, in France and Fred's postdoc, Lin Linda, I always miss their first name, Nancy Cohn, I know a Linda Cohn. And then James and Chris Riom, who's a former PhD student in the lab. So what we were asking is, does it matter if you are trained in that assay alone or as a group? Because the fly people have always put f groups of flies together to do the training. And we have two things we're asking. When you're trained, when you're conditioned to avoid that order with the shock, when you're taught, and then after, when you're tested uh, with the two odors. We have the training period and the testing period. And so they decided to look at groups of rovers and see how well they learn. And we knew already that rovers have better short-term memory than um, sitters do. So that's the group test that we knew about. But then they decide to train and test them alone. And, and we find that rovers do um, as well. But the sitters have a lot of trouble learning and remembering when they're alone, when they're as individuals. And we they then ask the question, is it the training period or is it the testing period? And so if you train them alone and tested them in groups, you still saw the effect. And so it, it showed that um, what mattered is the social context of the training and it only affects sitter learning. So here, they're conditioned and tested as a group, they're trained and tested as a group and they're doing fine, but when they are trained alone, they have trouble. And this training is very specific. It has to be spaced training to show this pattern. So there's space training, and that's like what I've told my children. When they study for exams, and they have an exam Friday, they should learn a little bit Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Just, and not cram, like I did, Thursday night, <laughs> the same amount of information in. And flies also show differences in learning and memory, depending on how you teach them. With rovers and sitters, when they're cramming for exams, they do the same. It's when we do this spaced training that we see the difference. So this was very interesting because the social context is affecting learning but in, a, in only one of the types. And again, we wanted to know, is this to do with the foraging gene? And so another thing that we can use to manipulate is we can use pharmacological manipulations. We can activate PKG with this, manip with this manipulation. And when we do that, we see we can make sitters learn very well, whether it's the sitter or the sitter mutant that we use. And then we can use an inhibitor of the PKG. And here, we end up making rovers poorer learners and sitters, um, again, are very low. So we know that this gene is involved. So there's two stories up till now. One is about the nutritional deprivation early in larval life, showing differences in um, 
in larvae and um, also in adult exploratory behavior, and then there's the social learning. So two more things. I wanted to say that this gene is found in many organisms, and there's been lots of work done in these. Also in honeybees, showing a shift from rover to sitter, in the from nurse to forager in the expression, and you can feed that same activator and change nurses precociously into becoming foragers. And there's difference in plasticity in ants of this defender guy and this forager guy, again, depending on the pharmacological manipulation that you do. So there's one quick other story that I want to tell you because it's really relevant to this audience. So there's a beetle, and this beetle ha practices parental care. There's a male and the female. They collect a dead mouse carcass. They roll it up and that's the nest for the babies. They lay the eggs somewhere else. The babies walk across. They crawl across their larvae, and then they go into the nest. This is work from Alan Moore at University of Georgia. And the father paroles the nest and licks it and, they, and keeps the ball going very well. And the mother, of course, is working her little butt off. I'm joking. But what she does is the babies beg for food by touching the mouth, and she regurgitates the food, just like birds, into the, into the mouth. And when you ha do this, and you look at foraging gene expression cloned in this animal, you see that when they're caring for the animals, whether you're females or males, you have an increase in the expression. And you can ask, does that increase in expression? Is it dependent on direct parental care? So it is when the mother or the father, and he can also feed the babies directly, that's when we get an increase in the, care, in the expression of the gene and the care. So in this case, we've added an activator and we've made the parents care more in terms of, of feeding them. But um, when it's indirect care, when they're walking around the nest ball, then you don't see that any of these activators had an effect. So here we see only the PKG activator has care increased. And when you really up the dose of PKG, you have larvae leaving the nest because they're grown up and you have the Jewish mother syndrome. The beetle mother runs after the larvae and tries to feed them. <laughs> I love that story. So it is also found in the uh, mushroom bodies as well. So now we're, we're also studying the human gene. We have many different polymorphisms in it. We have samples of individuals who are locomotors and assessors, individuals with eating disorders, and we're studying that more. So this is the lab, and these are the, the people who've done, whose work I talked about today in blue. Okay, thank you.